It's, it's important to understand that um, by the good grace of some other pollutants, some of that warming has been masked. So China is putting a, still burning a lot of sulphur-rich coal and that sulphur is acting to cool our planet. Jet contrails cool our planet um, and particulate matter can cool our planet. So the warming we're suffering today is it consistent with the sort of warming you'd expect from about 3.75 parts per 10,000 of CO2 equivalent? So about 0.75 parts are being masked by those cooling factors. But those cooling agents are so short-lived in the atmosphere. We learned earlier that, that sulphur only lasts a matter of hours in the atmosphere. Particulates are the same. Jet contrails are the same. But the greenhouse gases last a century. So I see that gas burden, the greenhouse gas burden, as a sort of, sort of Damocles hanging over our head and a thread that's holding it back are these other pollutants that we could, um, if we clean, is, as China cleans up its act, could really release the greenhouse gases to do their worst. In the light of that, what do we need to do to deal with this problem? We need to do, I think, three things, or we have three principal tools in our toolkit to deal with this. The first of them is just reduce our emissions. We've been talking about it for decades now and we've done nothing. But the sort of work that's now being done, for example, in California, really leads the way. Governor Schwarzenegger has pledged to reduce our emissions by 80%, or California's emissions by 80% in the next 40 years. What that really means is that Californians are going to be living in an effectively decarbonised economy four decades from now. Now, you know, a lot of you might remember Elvis and the Beatles. They're sort of four decades and more back in the past, you know. Four decades is not a long time to achieve true independence from fossil fuel burning. But we can do it, and we will do it. It's the sort of target that absolutely needs to happen. And it will happen through good regulation. And I just want to talk very briefly about the effectiveness of Californian regulation so far. You know, there's, if you compare the motor industry, the, the vehicle industry with the outboard motor industry, you see some very salutary things. Um, California has moved to regulate uh, outboard motors, so the things you put on your boats. Um, very effectively. Um, they were able to do it because the outboard industry is just not all that big and California is pretty big and they were able to just get their way. The motor industry, which they've been trying to regulate, has been just too big to be kind of bullied into submission, made to toe the line. They keep on suing California in the Supreme Court and delaying things and dragging it out as long as they can. What's the end result? The end result is, I hate to be rude, but I've got to be blunt, no one buys American cars overseas today, you know. Next year, the rules in China for motor vehicle sales are going to be such that you won't be able to sell American cars in China. They just don't meet the emission standards. And you see what's happening. The Japanese, who've had good regulation, have taken over the world. What's happened with the outboard motor um, industry? Evan Rood, who were one of the big producers of outboard motors, as a result of that good regulation, have produced the world's most revolutionary, um, non-polluting, quiet and efficient outboard motor I think that's ever been developed. It's called this Evinrude E-Tech. I have one. I know about these things. Um, but, you know, that's, it's the only outboard motor in the world that's, that's accredited to be sold in uh, or that meets emission standards for Europe and California. And it's going to do for the outboard motor industry what Toyota's hybrids have done for the car industry. So it just shows that it's not as if America's short of genius or great engineers or anything else. You know, if the regulation's right... You guys can take over the world. You've done it in the past. You do it again in various industry sectors. It's the lack of good regulation that's holding back American industry, in my view. And nothing shows it more clearly than that comparison that I just laid out. Um, the world is moving on this, and as we move to 80% emissions reductions, there's going to be more and more pressure on the polluting industries. We're going to have to deal with that problem. In order to get those sort of emission reductions, we're going to get, have to get the polluters to pay a significant price probably in the orders of, order of $70 a tonne for their pollution. At that sort of level, most of the renewables, including clean coal technology and so forth, becomes very cost-effective to get to market. And some wonderful things happen uh, in, in terms of uh, carbon sequestration in our soils, which I'll spend a minute uh, explaining. Um, if, if, 80, if $70 a tonne sounds like a lot, just consider what uh, has happened with the recent fuel price rises in this country. I know you used to pay around $2 a gallon, you're now paying 3 um, If you try to calculate what that means in terms of a carbon price, in other words, you ask how much of a, of a tax would we have needed to put on the oil industry to raise prices that high, 
what you find is that the, the cost would be between two and three hundred US dollars a ton to do that. So we're talking about seventy dollars a ton, which is what it's a it's somewhere between a third and a, a fourth of that cost. You, people have adjusted to the high fuel prices in this country. It hasn't sent the country broke. We're not talking about major imposts here. We're talking about reasonable imposts that will bring, I think, increased prosperity uh, to this country in the medium term. Tim Flannery, one of the world's leading explorers. He was named 2007 Australian of the Year. If you'd like a copy of today's show, you can go to our website at democracynow.org. When we come back, the conclusion of Tim Flannery's address. Benfield. Here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue with this special, we return to the conclusion of Tim Flannery's recent address in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Tim Flannery is the author of the book, The Weathermakers. That's his latest book. He spoke about what steps need to be taken to tackle climate change. Unfortunately, it's not going to be enough just to reduce our emissions in future. We're also going to have to draw some of the gas out of the air. And this atmosphere of ours is now burdened with about 200 gigatons of carbon that wasn't there in the past. That's built up since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And I see that gas as being... Um, it, it's the historic debt that we owe the world, you know, because we're the people who benefited from the Industrial Revolution. So we took the benefits of the process and we burdened the world with the pollution that resulted from that process. And I've been searching for ways to sort of, I think we all should be searching for ways as well, to repay that debt. One important way of doing it is the conservation of tropical forests. Half of the world's tropical forests have already been cleared. Um, they're incredibly important in regulating Earth's climate, not just from the carbon they sequester, but because of the, of the transpiration through their leaves that cools our planet. Studies suggest that we could repay about half of that debt, at least, that historic debt, so 100 gigatons of carbon which, as Aussies would say, is a load of carbon. And I won't explain how much a gigaton is, but a bloody lot. Um, by regrowing some of those tropical forests. How would we ever achieve that? You know, I, I know, I've worked in the tropics. I know how hard it is to deal fairly with people in that part of the world. I think you guys invented the answer, you Americans. If we could get a computer with an internet connection in every primary school in the tropics, you and I could go online using Google Earth or eBay and you know, Google up 500 villages in... Panama, you know, that want to sell their carbon, read about the villages, look at where they want to plant their carbon, and decide you're going to buy some of your climate security by paying online, paying those people online. The money could be held in escrow by an NGO um, and be paid once the carbon is sequestered, and we know it was sequestered because we could use satellite surveillance, which is already available, to be able to see that. What a wonderful tool to deal just directly, you know, a wealth transfer between the wealthiest people on the planet and some of the poorest. You know, they improving their on the planet, us purchasing our climate security. 